Okay, then. It appears that we are live for episode 36 of Space Rocks Uplink. Thanks so much to everybody who's joined us just now. And uh, we are just bringing Mark McCorkman into the chamber. Mark, how are you doing? Very good, Alex. Good to see you again. Good to see everybody online. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, still cold and windy and rainy and everything else. It's January still, but uh, we should bring some light onto the situation this evening. Yeah, indeed, in a, in a, in a matter of speaking, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, it, it's sort of um, a wonderful feature of what Space Rocks does that we can engage with so many different areas. I mean, last week we had illusionists on, you know, a, a research psychologist as well. Um, you know, um, tonight two genuine luminaries never sense the word and uh you know increasingly i find that people are joining us sometimes from from different avenues who might not know what space rocks is is all about so i just kind of thought it might be a good idea just to to walk through what why did we start this and why do we bring so many different people together in the way that we do it's a great question you know i mean it, it, it sort of seems obvious to us now but a few years ago we you know before we started this you know you and i met through as we've talked many times we met through the rosetta mission isa's mission to explore a comet out in the solar system um and we realized that you know there was a great deal of public interest in that but but it, it's one thing to do things online as we are now doing for other reasons but you know the idea of how, how do we how do we bring that science how do we bring the engineers how do we bring the scientists the astronauts how do we bring them to the, the the public but also you know how do we look at it in the broader context with society and culture and the overlaps that the inspiration that science can bring but the music and art and fiction and film uh, science fiction uh, you know that those things can bring and and the overlaps and so space rocks is a a cauldron for investigating those overlaps let's put it that way. Indeed, a, a cauldron is a great way of describing not just, uh, well, I guess what we do, but also, you know, kind of what the people who are about to join us do as well. Although the, quadr uh, the, the cauldrons are, uh, uh, I guess, very figurative and a lot bigger um, than what we're accustomed to visualizing. I mean, so, so, so who do we have joining us tonight? Because I'm excited, but in equal parts intimidated because, man, oh man, <laughs> what they get up to is pretty extraordinary. Well, absolutely right. Um, so the European Space Agency, of course, is um, it's a big organization that looks at space um, in the solar system and, and the, the broader universe, but it's just one of a whole bunch of what we call research infrastructures. So it's a very sort of technical term, but European organizations that investigate science um, by combining together and collaborating internationally. And ESA is a member of an organization called IRO Forum, where eight of the big research infrastructures in Europe come together to exchange best practices, to look at ways of collaborating scientifically. So this, for example, includes the European Southern Observatory, which is sort of our ground-based astronomy partners. And there's an obvious natural link to what we do in space. But at the other end, uh, we've got people like the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, who use intense X-ray beams to investigate you know, the kind of the heart of matter um, by, by sort of penetrating through at high energies and being able to freeze frame very, very short lived processes. We have the European Molecular Biology Lab, who, as the name says, you know, investigate molecular biology. And they've played a very strong role, for example, in the coronavirus pandemic, trying to understand um, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, SARS um, and uh, Two of the organizations who we have on this evening, um, you know, in a sense, deal with high energy physics, but for very different reasons. So most people are familiar with CERN, the giant atom smasher, 27 kilometer long tunnel underground um, on the border of France and uh, Switzerland, just outside Geneva. And it's fantastic this evening. Of course, it's famous for the discovery of the Higgs boson recently, but has a much longer history and a much bigger remit than that scientifically. And we have the Director General of CERN, Fabio Legenotti, joining us this evening. So that's uh, absolutely fantastic. And then another project, which is probably less known to many people, but is in, in some ways almost more important because it's applied physics research, is an organization called Eurofusion, and they manage the European collaboration of national research institutes collaborating together to understand nuclear fusion, using the power of the center of the sun to force together atoms to create electrical energy. Um, well, to create heat to begin with, but then you turn that into electrical energy. And of course, with climate change very much in the fore, 
of our minds these days, um, nuclear fusion is one of the possible ways of getting ourselves weaned off fossil fuels. So the program manager for Eurofusion is Tony Donne, uh, Dutch, working in, in, in Germany. Fabio is Italian, working in Switzerland. Um, and, uh, you know, between the two of them, I've known them for a number of years. We've worked with them on various projects, but they're great people to explore the bigger picture as well. Where did, where did that fundamental physics at CERN and the applied physics of Eurofusion, how do they influence culture and how is culture influenced by them? So, yeah, it's brilliant to have them both on this evening. Indeed. Well, it's a, it's a really big deal. And as ever, I guess we have many questions and uh, not just our own, but uh, we welcome them from uh, everyone who may be watching tonight, who is joining us via YouTube. And uh, uh, we'll try and get to them, but uh, just pop them in anytime and uh, we'll do our very best. So without further ado, we welcome Fabiola and Tony to the chat. Fabiola, how are you doing? I think you're first in. Welcome. Um, are you receiving? Hello. Hello, Alex. Hello, Mark. Hello, Tony. Right. Hi, Fabiola, Mark, Alex. How are you doing? Good evening, Tony. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, well, guys, um, uh, welcome and uh, thank you so much for sparing your time. I mean, uh, Mark just gave a fantastic introduction to, to what you do, and it is truly extraordinary. Um, I guess I just wanted to kind of start with a broad question. We always do. Um, you know, is the work that you do on the Large Hadron Collider, on ITER, is it as much a human achievement as it is a remarkable scientific achievement? Because it seems like so many people, so many countries are involved in this cooperative endeavor. It feels like there's a very human story to this as well. Absolutely. I can start, but absolutely, uh, of course, uh, these, these uh, endeavors require the, uh, the collaboration of many, many people from um, all over the world. No single country, not even a single continent could do, uh, um, could do the physics or the science that we are doing. Um, and it requires really um, working together across borders, um, people of different cultures, people coming from uh, countries that are not the best friends of each other. At CERN, for instance, we have 18,000 scientists. Some of them come from uh, countries in conflict. Um, and so it's, uh, for me, um, uh, this, uh, this, this, these activities and these projects are also um, a way of connecting people in our fractured world. Uh, they also have uh, a social um, a social goal, a social mission in, in some sense. Um, they show the way that, uh, and they, sh they show that when we, um, when we put aside our, um, um, our conflicts or our um, different opinions and uh, different traditions, different uh, uh, political um, ideas, etc., uh, and we focus on the common good, then humanity can do uh, great things. I yeah, fully concur with Fabiola, with what Fabiola said, because indeed there's countries collaborating in these projects which normally are, are having war with each other. And in principle, you mentioned ITER. ITER is the result of a, a discussion between Reagan and Gorbachev at the end of the Cold War. So it was one, uh, well, you could say it's a peace project. We started off as an example where the countries can collaborate together. And even in the time when there was an Iron Curtain, we worked quite extensively with the Russians and intensively, and people were go, going back and forth. And uh, so in that sense, uh, it's, it's, it's really helping. And sometimes I say that politicians, they tend to build walls. Fortunately, we lost one of these politicians uh, yesterday. <laughs> but scientists, they build bridges. And, and so we, we really sometimes make connections, which then later could, could lead also to to a better bonding between different nations. So let's let for the benefit of the audience, you know, many of whom um, will be well, they'll be aware of what you're doing. But let, let's try and dig in a little bit on the details. So Fabio, let's start with what's behind you there, that that slightly curving tunnel. Uh, it's not a straight line, and th that's an important thing. And of course, you talked about the fact that it's you know we operate across borders. That machine literally operates across a border. Um, so tell us a little bit about the history of well CERN and and the Large Hadron Collider, which is well, it's it's the current big thing, but it, it it's not the last big thing, hopefully. 
Yeah, so let me just uh, remind everyone that CERN uh, is an intergovernmental organization based on a treaty um, between member states. It was founded in 1954. So this was in the aftermath of World War II uh, with, two, uh, with two goals. Uh, goal number one was to uh, bring back to uh, Europe excellence in, uh, in scientific research. Of course, during the war, several scientists has, had left Europe and therefore to re build science in Europe. So in some sense, there was already this um, visionary um, understanding uh, that the economical uh, uh, growth and the uh, um, rebirth and the de development of Europe also goes through science. And the second um, motivation was what we call science for peace, what we were saying before, um, that is um, uh, fostering peaceful collaboration among European countries uh, through science and actually science can be a group. So CERN is um, 66 years old now uh, and the Large Hadron Collider is, can, is currently our flagship project, is the, uh, is the most uh, powerful accelerator ever built by um, humanity. It's a 27 kilometer ring, 100 meter underground. You can see behind me this nice, um, uh, the spectacular uh, picture of the underground uh, uh, tunnel. And in this tunnel, we accelerate two beams of Protons. protons are the nuclei of hydrogen. Everybody knows what protons are. And they are these two beams of protons are accelerated in the two opposite direction and uh, very close to the speed of light and then brought uh, into collision at four points of the ring where we have installed in four big underground caverns four uh, instruments that we call particle detectors. They are quite big. Uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, one of them, Atlas, is say half Notre Dame in Paris, so it's not a little thing. And these detectors um, detect the results of the, um, of the collision between, uh, between protons and therefore uh, they allow us to understand what happened in this collision. And in, in this collision, there are many things that can happen. Uh, protons can uh, go into thousands of pieces to use a non-scientifically non-rigorous uh, language, but then we can understand how the fundamental constituents of protons um, uh, act. But also in the collision, new particles can be created like the, the famous six boson, which was discovered here at CERN in uh, 2012. So this allows us to study the, the, the laws of nature at the most fundamental level. Particle physics is the most fundamental of all sciences because it studies the, the smallest constituents of, the mat of matter and of the universe. So let, let me just pick up on that before we go over to the, to the plasma side, because, you know, people, you know, the, what you said is, of course, absolutely true, but to, to give a sense of scale, the, the proton beams have, you know, a few trillion protons, so tiny, tiny amounts of mass and you've got this monstrous machine or machines weighing tens of thousands of tons sort of leveraging as this anvil to try to get these tiny beams so I'm just wondering if you can give us a bit of a feel because of course that's not just an it's not just not a vacuum tube it's an incredibly cold tube and there are magnets involved so the the, the technical challenge it's not just let's just fire two beams of protons together Absolutely. i mean I, of course you know for, again for the sake of the audience give us some of the, some of the idea of some of the monstrous challenges which had to be yes. solved to make so this uh, so yes thank you mark for this very good question so actually um uh, realizing and implementing and, and, and the LHC and discovering the exposon required a big jump in the concept and in the technologies. So for instance, you see behind me, um, at, toward the back of the picture, you see uh, some blue tubes uh, these tubes contain superconducting magnets of new generation that are still today, you know, for, a, for an accelerator of the scale of the LHC, still the, the most uh, advanced we have today. Although more powerful magnets exist, but, um, but not at the level of being deployed in a big accelerator. And so these, acceler these magnets are made of uh, superconducting material. They work. Uh, because they are superconducting at 1.9 Kelvin. 1.9 Kelvin means minus 270 degrees, 1.9 degrees from the from absolute zero, uh, which makes uh, the LHC uh, perhaps the, the the coldest place in the universe because the, the the temperature of the outer space and the temperature of the universe today is larger than 1.9 Kelvin. So this is one example. Um, as you as you mentioned, this um, this the, the particle beams contains thousands of, uh, of, 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 of billions or, 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 or of, uh, of protons. 
and, and yet the, the, the cross section of the beams is like uh, human hair uh, when they collide, it's uh, you know, less than 20 microns. So clearly that's another example. In the collision, although the accelerator is, is cold because it's, um, it's, uh, it's immersed in a, in, a, in, a, in a bath of about 130 tons of uh, superfluid helium, when the two beams collide, uh, locally, they produce an energy which corresponds to 100,000 billion uh, times the, the temperature in a, in, a, in a room, the room temperature. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, the size of the experiments, uh, each experiment contains 100 million of um, silicon sensor, and we use something like 3,000 kilometers of cable to bring the signal from the underground cavern where the experiments sit to the control room um, on the surface where the data are stored. And uh, the RHC has um, recorded so far and the data that we have uh, that we used at the RHC uh, um, amount to something like one exabyte, something like that. So these are a few numbers to, to give you an idea of the challenges. So Tony, you know, on your side, um, the machine you have behind you there, I, I'm guessing is JET, uh, a, a column in the UK. And it's a kind of a compact version in a sense, a smaller version of a tokamak, which is the, the model for for ITER. And now you have a, a slightly different problem. You're, you're, you're not so much trying to, uh, I mean, you, again, it's an incredibly high temperature device, but it's high temperature to simulate the center of the sun. But of course that will just melt the machine. So so how do you, how do you avoid that happening, right? How do you contain the sun in a chamber? Yeah, we, well, there's a secret there. We use magnets. Um, uh, in, in principle, what we're doing is quite similar to what CERN is doing. So we have also a ring. Our ring is a little bit smaller in diameter. And we are also uh, trying to smash uh, isotopes of protons uh, on top of each other. So we use uh, deuterium and, and tritium, which are both isotopes of, of uh, normal hydrogen. And um, in the very early days of, of fusion, uh, ideas was, well, let's use an accelerator like CERN has. You take a block of ice and you just hit the atoms in the ice and then you get fusion. Now, what happens is that most of the, of the atoms, they basically will, will lead to a melting of the ice and, and you don't get fusion. Um, it's, it's very difficult and, and well, if you have ever played midget golf, there's always this, this lane, I think it's lane number nine, which is this little volcano with a hole in the middle. <laughs> and that's always damn difficult to hit because you have to direct, the, the direction needs to be right and the speed. If you go too fast, you go over it. If you go slow, it comes back. If you angle is a little bit different, it goes off at the side. Well, fusion is similar. Now, uh, if we do it in, in uh, let's say, a plasma, a plasma is nothing than a very hot gas, which is fully ionized, then all the reactions which don't lead to fusion, they don't lead to a loss because the particles, they maintain their energy and they can then go to for, for further collision. So what we're doing in this, this giant ring here behind me is we take a, a, a gas of hydrogen, heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, and we heat it to temperatures which are 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. And uh, we can do that by, by using radio frequency techniques. We can use it uh, neutral beams. And at these very high temperatures, the particles are charged. So we can contain them with magnetic fields. So around this chamber are giant magnetic magnets which hold the plasma from the wall. And you can see that behind me in this, this very, I'm sorry, my hand is, well, that's the, the with the virtual background. My hand Come is. On, you, you spent a year in Zoom, and you know, must know which hand hand is which. Yes. <laughs> that's 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 why. Well, sometimes I use different backgrounds, <laughs> uh, but but um, you see the the light uh, uh, the the line uh, which is going up, which is actually the outside of the plasma. That's the coolest part, and the coolest part gives the most light because in the center of the plasma is so hot that we don't have any, any visible radiation because all the particles are fully ionized and you don't get radiation. But at the edge, the temperature is only in the order of 10,000 degrees and you see light. And so with the magnets, we can keep this very hot gas away from the wall. And, and in this way, we can then uh, create temperatures which are needed to, to make fusion. Now, let, let me just pick up on a couple of technical things there so the audience understands in the sun, the sun is fusing ordinary hydrogen, one proton, 
um, mm -hmm. you are using deuterium and tritium. And then you said that, you know, you're heating to 10 times the temperature of the center of the sun. So, you know, the, the naive question was, what's wrong with using normal hydrogen and why bother making it 10 times hotter? I mean, it's not really the center of the sun is the answer to that question, I guess. Well, that's a very good question. Well, actually, in the sun, you, you try to, to fuse uh, multiple protons to, to helium. So it's, it's a, a reaction which basically uh, you, you need uh, either a much higher density or you need a, a higher temperature. At the sun, you have an enormous density, which we don't have on Earth. And that's why uh, on Earth, we can only mimic this reaction by going to a temperature which is 10 times hotter than the sun. And then the reaction between deuterium and tritium is by far the easiest. So it, it peaks at the lowest temperature and it has also the highest reaction probability if you compare it to um, the fusion between protons or with some, well, you're, you're from space science. Some people say we need to go to deuterium three helium fusion. Um, um, we need to get the three helium from the moon. That's a possibility, but also for that one, you need a higher temperature. So we first want to do the trick at the at the cheapest um, uh, way, and then later we can look into more exotic uh, variants. Hmm. So I, I wondered if we could, um, you know, zoom out um, just uh, a little bit, you know, because I, I think a lot of people who are familiar um, with, you know, so many of the guests that we've had on Space Rocks, we're frequently talking about things to do with the world of space exploration. And obviously some of that will be, you know, about getting there, you know, um, and so on. But one thing that I think is so common, you know, between all of these things and the work that you both do is the incredible timescales that are required in order to build these machines. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, something like the LHC obviously did not come together overnight. And Fabio, I wondered if you could walk us through that process. I, I read that you began at CERN in 1994, if I remember correctly. And, and so, so you've been present through so much of that process. And I wondered if you could kind of give us a, a sense of that time scale. Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you, um, Alex. So uh, actually the first uh, ideas about um, building a proton-proton collider in the existing 27 kilometer ring uh, at CERN because the, the, the underground tunnel existed already and uh, had housed another accelerator before. The first ideas were discussed in 1985. Then uh, R&D work for development of the, the um, uh, for, for the components of the accelerator and for the detector started in the early 90s. Construction in the second half of the 90s, and then uh, until um, until uh, the 25 or so, and then installation started. And um, sorry, 2005 or so, and then installation started and operation. Uh, and commissioning and then operation uh, started in 2009 and the RHC will be running until 2038 or so. So a very, very long journey made of different steps that go from um, uh, the first ideas about the physics potential and the, and the technological challenges. And at the beginning, everything looks like mission impossible. It's impossible to do something like that. It's so ambitious, it's so much you know, difficult, more difficult than what we have done so far. And then, of course, with the patience and the perseverance of the, uh, of the physicists and engineers, you start step by step in putting all the problems on the table and solving them one by one. Huge challenges, because when you, you work at the limit of the technology, it's not deja vu, it's not something that people can do like routine work. You are exposed to problems every day. And there comes the perseverance of these thousands of people from all over the world, which are animated by just one goal, getting there, funding the Higgs boson, understanding uh, the difference between matter and antimatter, or finding uh, the particles that made up, make up the dark matter. So, and then after zillions of difficulties and challenges, and uh, then at the end, you switch it on and it works wonderfully. And you know what? it works even much better than any, uh, than expectations, uh, much better than design, uh, than design uh, um, performance. And that's the greatest uh, reward for a scientist. Well, it's, it's fascinating. And I wondered if I could follow up there because you just um, took the words out of my mouth because I was going to ask, is there a room with the big light switch kind of thing? Because of course you get to the point where you built it all and then I guess you have to turn it on. And 
Tell us a little bit about that moment, because, you know, again, we talk to people, you know, who they're sending probes to land on comets and all kinds of things. There's always, no matter what the project might be, what you might call a moment of truth, you know, and, and what, what was that in, in your experience, in your perspective? Well, it was, first of all, for me, it was uh, when in, uh, in, um, in uh, March 2010, uh, the LHC collided beams uh, at an energy which is slow, uh, lower than what we have today. So it was not the final uh, energy, but it was larger than uh, any collision energy achieved uh, before in an accelerator on Earth. And so, uh, and I remember we were all in, a, in the control room of the LHC, which was packed with many, many people. Of course, the, the accelerator operators who were at the desk and really, uh, you know, uh, piloting the beams. And then uh, many, many other people following that. Some of us were in our, in the control rooms of the experiments. I was in the control room of the Atlas experiment. And when you see um, in the screens, uh, those beams colliding in, uh, in the detector and then um, the detector monitors show actually a, a collision um, and, the, and the spray and, 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 the, and the fire of particles coming out of that collision, that's really a, 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 a memorable time. And uh, it's a big, a big emotion, comparable to, of course, um, the discovery of the explosion, which was also a very a great, great emotion. But of course, that's the moment of the truth. Uh, but of course, we had been working so, uh, so much on that project and we had checked and, uh, and we checked everything. And of course, you have to understand that the quality control is fantastic. It's a bit like the, the space missions, you know, when you send something on the, on the space station, it cannot fail and you cannot go in there and repair every, every three minutes. But similarly, also for us, we cannot go down in the tunnel and repair things uh, every day. Otherwise, uh, it becomes impossible. You know, the, the, the core of the detectors or the experiments is essentially not accessible. If you have a problem, you have to open and repair. It takes uh, months, if not years. So really, the reliability of every single component, or every single screw, every single connector must be, uh, you know, um, en en enormous. So, um, and at the end, these things work well. Hmm. But take the, the same question to you, Tony. Of course, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the famous adage that nuclear fusion is always 50 years away um, uh, and it has been forever. Now, you know, so the, the time scale on which these projects work is very similar again. And, and JET, which is behind you there, has been in operation for many years in different guises, different experimental guises. But, but similarly, walk us through ITER because ITER is now, there's a huge amount of metal and concrete and physics in the south of France, near, in, uh, in Cadarache in the south of France. Give us a sense of the time scale, because you, you said it started with Gorbachev and Reagan, which is, you know, for, for kids of today is ancient history, or not, not even history that they were aware of. Mm -hmm. And yet we're still some years away from ITER coming online. Yeah, well, that's an interesting time. There, there was in 1985, this, this uh, summit meeting, it was the end of my PhD. I did my PhD in, well, actually, I, I wouldn't call it high energy physics, but more medium energy physics. Um, uh, so basically also using the, the kind of technology behind uh, Fabiola. And I saw on television the meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev and talking about this fusion source. And I thought, well, wow, that's interesting. I want to go there. So I, I switched field and started then. And uh, it was three years later that the ITER, ITER conceptual design activity kicked off. Uh, it was uh, done in Russia, Japan, Europe, and the United States. And 10 years later, in 1998, we had the uh, design of, of ITER, the engineering design ready. We could, were ready to build it. Then our American friends, they found the device too expensive. They wanted to go to a cheaper device, a smaller device. We started a whole redesign. We worked for three years on it. In 2001, we had like a half big design, but um, this was enough for the Americans to come back. Uh, also China, India, South Korea joined. And um, we have then been talking uh, five years just about politics, where to build the device. There were four potential sites, uh, one in Canada, two in Europe, one in Japan. Uh, so it was a enormous road pulling. Ultimately, it uh, was decided to have the machine in, in France. Then it took a number of years to set up the uh, international organization. And again, to agree on, on how to divide the work, to again, review the whole design. 
And we lost, I think, the whole political uh, uh, discussions, I think, have led to a delay of more than 10 to 15 years. So it's, it's basically until 2015 uh, that the project is reasonably well under control. I should say that we also had the, um, you know, we had this kind of agreement with Japan uh, that, okay, the machine will be built in Europe, but the first director needs to come from Japan and the second director too. And these people, they were basically chosen for geopolitical reasons, but not because they were the most brilliant leaders of an international organization. So the first few years of the ITER project, much work was, was done, which could have been done much more efficient. And, and that takes a while. So uh, we are now in, um, well, basically you have been on the side a few years ago. Um, um, so we are now putting the machine together. And that is uh, tremendous. So ITER is a little bit bigger than Jet behind me. But just before uh, you go, the, just before you go on, because of course, you know, we know that that tunnel behind Fabiola curves twenty-seven kilometers. How big is that thing behind you? There's no human for scale. Um, so just give us a sense of what we're actually seeing there in terms of physical scale. The uh, the, the, uh, the diameter is is about uh, uh, six six meters. So the major radius is order order uh, three meters. Uh, well, two meters. Sorry, it's three meters high. Uh, so a human can stand in this chamber. Right. Uh, so, well, ITER is a little bit bigger. So ITER, the, the largest magnets in ITER have a diameter of, of 30 meters. They're, they're all superconducting. Um, and we're now putting the machine together. We put a cryostat, which is also uh, a little larger than 30 meter diameter. We put that uh, now in the, in the basement. And this was a humongous lift. It was, I forgot the weight, but it's, it's basically weighing, uh, uh, I think two fully loaded Boeing uh, 747s. And it was put with a precision of only a few millimeters in, in the pit and also all the magnets. So we are, we are, we are, we are basically working with, with enormous, uh, uh, big and heavy components. And we are able to place them uh, with, with really millimeters, sometimes sub-millimeter precision. Also behind me, all these tiles, they are placed with uh, a, a precision which is better than a millimeter. Because as soon as you have tiles which are sticking out, then there could be hot spots and, and you get melting and whatever. So, so just just give us a feeling, because because the, the tiles are very important in a component, right? If you have a if you have a, a plasma, it's making energy, but you've got to get the energy out. I can't just go in there and sort of take it out in a bucket and pour it somewhere, right? So the the, the, the give us a little bit of an insight into how you actually extract the energy from the machine. Well, in a, in a working fusion reactor, it's basically the neutron. So you have the deuterium and the tritium, they collide, and then you get helium and a neutron. The neutron has a lot of energy, it's neutral, it doesn't feel the magnetic field, and it will escape from the plasma and it will go into the wall. So it basically goes into the wall. And in ITER and also in the future fusion reactor, uh, reactors, the wall will be extremely thin because the neutron should not be stopped in the wall, but it should stop, be stopped in the blanket behind the wall. And there the neutron will give all its energy to, to the wall, so the wall will heat up and we use the heat then to drive turbines. With the neutron, we also split lithium, and that you could say lithium is actually the other part of the fuel. We split lithium into helium and tritium because tritium doesn't occur in nature and we make it in the machine ourselves. And, and so that's, that's the way it works. Of course, you have also the heat from the reaction we extract the heat at the bottom of the device. You can see that in the picture next to me where, where all the light is coming from, that part we, we call the diverter. So there we have a structure where the field lines actually hit the wall, but under a very grazing incident so that the heat is spread over as large as possible a surface. And um, the, the uh, material there, we use uh, tungsten, which has a very high melting point of, of um, uh, 3,200 degrees. And um, well, basically the tiles, they get up to 1,000, 1,200 degrees, so they can easily withstand that. And this is how we extract the, the heat out of the machine. Hmm. And before we go back to Alex, just, just, you know, I'm just trying to think in real time, what would be an equivalent of turning the LHC on and seeing the first collisions? And I, I want to come back to the question about, you know, d discovering the Higgs boson. It's not as if you looked under a rock and there was one hiding. Of course, it's a, let's, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but I wonder whether, for example, in the fusion reactor game that, you know, that the, the big moment is break even, that point where you get more energy out than you actually put in. 
you know, because, you know, if, if it costs you more energy to heat the machine up than you actually get out, it's useless. And that, yeah. of course, is the big game, which which Eater and then Demo, which come afterwards, that's what, what you're after, right? L long sustained periods of getting more energy out than you put in. Well, break even is, is always a good moment. At, at Jet, we almost can, can achieve that. Uh, so uh, in the course of this year, we are going to operate JAT uh, for the first time since 1997 uh, uh, with deuterium tritium, and we are going to create real fusion reactions. This will be very good because we can do a lot of experiments which are, are very um, important for ITER because they, they can uh, see, uh, we, we can understand the physics of the fast ions, but also we can train the engineers and the scientists to work with tritium because working with tritium is completely different than working with normal hydrogen. Uh, so in that sense, the break even is important. We will not achieve it here, but we will achieve that for the first time in ITER. And in ITER, the plasma can generate five, uh, 10 times more energy than we basically put in. Still, we don't create electricity with ITER. So it's still, in that sense, a scientific experiment. Um, so the first electricity will be with the demonstration reactor, which we are designing already now, mm. and which should become an operation in the early 50s. So it's, it's really a long, so this 30 years is about right. Yeah. The, the, the one little fact before we go on, which I love when we, you know, it's fantastic to visit. Yeah, any of these machines I've been to CERN, I've been lucky enough to be to CERN a few times down in the tunnel, seeing the experiments and Cadarash as well. And, and the one I went away with was, of course, to, to turn the machine on, you need to draw energy from the French grid. And there was this lovely story about, you know, drawing so much energy from the French grid just for the startup of the reactor that everybody's voltage within 100 or 200 kilometers goes down just a little bit for a few seconds. So everybody watching Netflix suddenly goes, what What the ha What happened? Oh, they just turned on ETA, you know. Mm. I, I, <laughs> so that real world impact, it's not completely self-contained. Well, it's, it's complete. Well, actually, I can tell there an anecdote that we are not uh, basically allowed to to uh, uh, operate that uh, during during the uh, episodes of EastEnders or any. <laughs> any okay. And also not during during breaks in, in soccer matches during World Cups or Euro Cups, because then everyone is going to make coffee or going to the fridge to take a beer. And that's when the energy peaks in the UK. We are not allowed to, to run jet then. So we get from the electricity company uh, some time slots when we are not allowed to operate a machine. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely astonishing. But, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, following on from that, um, uh, perhaps going um, to another thing, and this is a bit of a, a loaded question. I, I suppose even, you know, uh, you know Mark, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure will have something to say on this. You know, talking about the genesis of these incredible projects that span generations and so on how do you keep the drive to create these things separate from geopolitics you know which obviously i mean it all must intermingle and so on you know just when you're bringing countries together in that way do these projects i guess are they sometimes threatened by those complexities i mean then how do you navigate those potential problems well for what concerns cern we are uh, lucky enough to um, to be a uh, uh, an intergovernmental organization based on a treaty, as I said before, we have today 23 member states. At the, at the beginning, uh, um, at the time of when CERN was, um, was founded, the member states were, were, were 12. And, um, and the member states are very much committed to CERN. They uh, contribute uh, the CERN budget, uh, which is about 1.2 billion Swiss francs a year. And uh, that's the key. You cannot, you cannot uh, implement, you cannot think, even think of project that spans decade without having a, a solid budget, a sustained, a continued budget over many, many, many years. So this is the reason of the secret why, why, why CERN actually another uh, intergovernmental organization in, in, in Europe like uh, ESO, ESA, etc. They, 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 uh, they are successful because we have this continuity of budget uh, that allows us to plan uh, uh, for projects that span over 50 years or, or, or more. So, uh, uh, and I must say, uh, until now, um, the CERN member states have been so committed to CERN. So, um, you know, that even uh, in, in, in period of COVID crisis, they uh, continue to support us and, uh, and that's great. And, and Tony, you mentioned also, I mean, it's it, in a way, I mean, if I just flip that question around briefly, I mean, 
it seems to me kind of crazy that it seems almost harder to persuade the world to invest in fusion energy than it is in the fundamental physics and blue skies of CERN. I mean, I know it's not that that's a very simplified version of it, you know, because it's entirely obvious what, you know, ITER and the machines come, what they can do for the world. And yet, you know, you have to persuade people to do it. And the same is true with the particle physics as well. I mean, so, you know, to sort of flip the question, how do you also engage people and say, this is worth doing at the outset? Let me do it. You know, it's going to take 50 years. Give me a solid budget you know uh, and i remember you know, fa famously i think you know the higgs boson and how it was described to margaret thatcher seemed to play a role in the united kingdom there's a legend about you know a very simple story of walking around the room and how margaret thatcher walks through a room and attracts people because she's popular and an important and she's kind of the higgs boson of politicians so I, I i you know not stealing alex's question but i'm curious about how do you create the momentum to do something which you know, the Higgs boson. I mean, so what? I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I mean that as a provocative question. You know, you know what I think about it. But, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's true. It's, it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult. You, you see it now uh, also in, in Europe. So we had a COVID, uh, there's this COVID recovery fund. We have in Europe the, the Green Deal. And uh, for instance, fusion research is not part of that because it said fusion will not contribute to the CO2 transition before 2050. And, and that's true, but we're still needed afterwards. And, and many politicians have, unfortunately, the idea that wind and solar uh, can cover all the world energy needs. And um, well, here in Germany, um, uh, where, where I live now, uh, for instance, the German uh, government um, subsidizes wind and solar every year with 26 billion, 27 billion. It's an enormous amount of money. That's, that's the cost of one liter per year. And this is already since the start of the Energiewende, which was uh, at, at Fukushima, so 10 years ago. And the CO2 emission by the electricity generation in Germany is still the same. <laughs> and uh, only last year it was better, but that's thanks to COVID and not thanks to wind and solar. Um, and uh, well, the reason is that Germany, at the same time when they uh, they ramped up wind and solar, they have been ramping down nuclear. Nuclear is, of course, also CO2 free. And uh, the uh, other half is basically uh, exported on, on very windy days. Germany has too much energy. Uh, the electricity price goes negative, so they pay the neighboring countries to take the energy. <laughs> and countries like Switzerland, Austria, Norway, they take the energy and pump water up in artificial lakes. And then on days when Germany doesn't have enough energy, Germany can buy it back. So Germany pays three times. So for <laughs> generation, for selling it, and then, uh, well, actually uh, for, for paying people to take it and then to buy it back. And, and then sometimes when I then hear that, uh, you know, fusion, we don't get a budget. Whereas I think if, if this, this is a long way, but if it really is going to work, I, I think we, dis we, we basically should do this for all our children and grandchildren, because it's, it's probably the only way to cover all the energy needs. And I didn't see yet that fossil fuels at any place in the world have been replaced by any other sources. You can do it maybe in an isolated country, but worldwide, uh, I, I think we, we, we really need to do this. And um, uh, so this is usually the story I go to politicians and try to, to at least um, uh, motivate them to at least that they see that there is a need for this kind of research. Mm. So, so Fabiola, you're now, you know, you have the LHC, it's there, it's in operation for many more years, but you're also looking at new machines perhaps using the same tunnel, perhaps building a bigger tunnel or a linear accelerator. I'm, I'm not fully up to speed. You can, you can tell us you know, where those things are. How, it's your job to lead the persuasion. How do you persuade governments that there's physics out there which is unknown, but that it's, it's interesting, but is not going to change in the same way potentially that fusion will change? I mean, that's hard enough already, it seems. So how do you see, how do you persuade politicians to invest in this next generation of big machine? Yeah, so there are various, uh, the various elements uh, there. Um, first of all, I think we have to state and to persuade people, politicians and also the public, that uh, knowledge and, and, and pushing back the limits of knowledge of, of humanity, it's per se intrinsically an important thing to do. 
you know, we are clever beings and we are not here just to, you know, just to eat or to sleep or uh, we, have a, we have a brain and, and with our brain, humanity managed to do unbelievable things and, uh, and, and continuing to uh, increase our knowledge, understanding how nature works, understanding um, how the universe evolved and where it will go. That's, it's, it's, it's a duty uh, of, of, of humanity. So uh, pushing back the limits of knowledge is the first thing. And, uh, and we want to continue this exploration uh, in all fields, of course, not only particle physics, there are many other fields, of course, of science, but we cannot stop uh, humanity from, you know, um, and, uh, from, 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 from increasing the, um, our knowledge of, 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 of the universe and, uh, and everything that surrounds us. This is the first thing. Of course, the other thing is the recognition also that um, history, history shows that, uh, that very often breakthroughs um, uh, in, uh, in knowledge uh, come, from, uh, come from fundamental research. Uh, of course, research in general and scientific research is the fuel of progress. And without uh, the new ideas that come from research, progress at some point stagnates, it doesn't continue to, and, and from time to time you need breakthroughs. Uh, the example that I give is that uh, the, um, the light that we have in our houses is not just the uh, adiabatic, the just the, the evolution of a candle. It's not that by, by building bigger and more colorful candles that you get the light that we have uh, at home. It required a jump in the concept uh, and in understanding of how uh, the fundamental the, the, or the foundation of physics. So clearly, um, there is also the uh, awareness that uh, that fundamental research can contribute to great breakthrough. It can be disruptive in a positive sense for uh, for uh, for society. Another important element is that uh, fundamental research, I would say, in essentially all fields, nowadays is a driver of innovation because it requires. Uh, very advanced technologies, cutting edge technology that no industry would develop, uh, and, and only and only fundamental research uh, can can actually undertakes and, and, and develop because there is a push to uh, go beyond in some sense. So uh, it also allows us to make um, jumps in uh, in in concept in, in technologies through the fact that the instruments that we need. Are really stretched in all uh, in all sense. From uh, from uh, we mentioned tonight uh, with with Tony, uh, superconducting uh, magnets and materials, big data, fast electronic, radiation hard um, uh, devices. You know, you name them. But it's a, it's it's an enormous amount of um, of uh, of new uh, uh, technologies and new uh, new ideas. So I think these are the, the elements that. Um, that convince uh, the governments and I hope also uh, and also the, the, the public that it's really worth investing in, in, in knowledge. I'm j just curious, just you know, one last point on that. I mean, probably, you know, it, it, almost by accident, necessity, but by accident, you know, the, the, the huge, the, probably the biggest economic uh, lever that CERN has had is through the World Wide Web. I mean, uh, the, the need to, to parse the data and store the data and make data accessible led to something which now, I don't know, does anybody have any idea what the, that the economic value of the World Wide Web is on an annual basis? I mean, it's behind everything in, in the economy, it seems, these days. Yes, and there is an, another element, Mark, which is very, also very important. That organization uh, like CERN and other intergovernmental, intergovernmental organization, funded by public money, do promote and apply uh, a, a, an approach and a philosophy of open access. Whatever we do at CERN is available to everybody for free. So the the web was developed by by uh, Tim Berners Lee at CERN in 1989 when he was. As an employee working in our IT uh, uh, department, and was made available to everyone to use and uh, and develop in 1993 uh, by CERN. So, and nobody is paying anything for using the web. So, again, research, scientific research, and fundamental research, which is the one that is funded mainly by government, as applied as as opposed to applied research, which is more in the in the private sector. Being being uh, funded by public money is immediately available to society at zero cost. So that's also a very important. Uh, yeah. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tony. It looks like you're about to. No, no, I, I, why I can add to that, that well, indeed, uh, well, although let's say we, we, we could say, well, fusion is applied science because we're working for, uh, let's say, a future energy source, but at the same time, we're doing a lot of fundamental science. But certainly what, what Fabiola said, all the industries which are working with us, which, which really have to improve the state of art of innovation, they lead to, to spin off in other areas. And, and for instance, the, the, the companies we work with on superconductors, they're now building medical resonance imaging. The cockpit of the A380, uh, which is made in France, is a spin off of fusion technology. And, and so there's many of these examples where industry, which is working with us as organizations, they don't earn a lot of money from the products they make because they just, well, sometimes they even make a loss. But at the same time, they, they get uh, such a higher innovation level in the industry that they get an advance over the competitors. So usually they earn a lot more in, in let's say, the, the other markets. Um, and and, and that, that's really nice to see. And, and the companies, they also very often quote that as, as examples. And we use that then also towards a politician. Well, look, it's not only about science. It's also about increasing the industrial competitiveness. Absolutely. And also, if I can add to what Tony said, it's very important, this point of collaboration with industry, which is really working together. It's not just a client provider relationship. When you want to build the, uh, the, the 1,200 magnets that uh, populate the Large Hadron Collider, the uh, superconducting magnets, is not something that you develop at CERN and you give it to industry, industry will build it. We work together. So there is a long uh, phase of prototyping and improving and, uh, and changing and uh, et cetera, where research, science and industry work hand in hand. So it is a very healthy process that as Tony was saying, gives a, a, uh, uh, has an impact of industry that goes beyond the financial volume of the contract is knowledge, mm -hmm. culture, uh, development and uh, opening other markets and, and growing the knowledge of society uh, and growing the technology uh, spread of what uh, what we do. Alex, go ahead. Oh um, well, no, I'm uh, just curious. Uh, you know, paraphrasing a few of the uh, questions that are coming up, we have people watching from Massachusetts to Mexico, uh, and just about everywhere in between, which is uh, a lovely thing. I mean, so so what are those next horizons? You know, just uh, what what do you hope uh, uh, we can move toward next in terms of you know discovery? And so on. I know that's a, a really big question, but uh, but I guess such an important one is, as as we kind of hear so much has happened just in the last few years and decades. So Alex, I cannot tell you what the next discoveries will be because we don't know. We are doing research, but I can tell you what are the questions that we try to address. And uh, and today uh, there are still many important outstanding questions uh, in fundamental physics that have to do with, um, with the universe and we the, the um, particle physics and um, astroparticle and cosmology. So for instance, uh, um, the Higgs boson itself is still quite a mysterious particle. It's, uh, it's completely different from the other elementary particle discovered so far. The world of elementary particles contains 17 particles. The Higgs boson is number 17 in, in, in terms of discovery. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very special particle that has very special features. We call these quantum numbers in, in, in physics. And, um, and um, uh, it interacts also with the other particles in different ways, um, carries a different force um, compared to the forces that we know, the, the, the strong electromagnetic and weak force that act among elementary particles. And so understanding the X boson in details is uh, really an important uh, endeavor in order to, um, uh, how to say, address and answer other open questions. So what are the other open questions? The other open question is what we call the dark universe. 95% of the universe is unknown, um, is made of form of energy and matter that we don't know. Dark matter in particular is 25% of the universe. What is dark matter made of? Nobody knows. And understanding dark matter and dark energy is, I would say, the obsession of, uh, of physicists and scientists across the world, uh, working in different fields, not only in particle physics, but also in cosmology and other. So that's an example. You know, uh, uh, Today, we only know 5% of the universe. Mm -hmm. Understanding the composition of dark matter will allow us to, to uh, 
to increase our knowledge from 5% to 30%. It's, of course, uh, a big jump. Uh, we, we don't understand why the universe today is almost only made of matter. Where did the antimatter go at the time of the big explosion that gave origin to the universe, uh, the Big Bang, back 14 billion years ago? Matter and antimatter were present in the same, um, the same fraction, the same level. And then at some point, something happened uh, in the universe and the antimatter disappeared or went somewhere. We don't know where and uh, we don't know why. And it is thanks to that that we are here today. Otherwise, we will not uh, exist. We, uh, by the way, we will not uh, exist without the exposure. So all these things are, these little tiny particles are important also for our own existence. So you see, uh, these are very, very important questions that we try to address. And there are many, many others, but you know, they are important, you know, knowing only 5% of the universe today is at the same time embarrassing for a scientist, you know, so little after so many centuries, at the same time, so exciting because there is, a lot to, um, to learn. So, so, so some of those questions, Fabiola, are addressed by upgrading the LHC itself um, to effectively getting to higher energies so that you can create conditions when the proton beams hit each other. And it's not only proton beams, of course, because you fire ions around, heavy mm -hmm. ions. Um, but, but you know, it runs out of steam at some point, the LHC. It can't go beyond a certain point. So you're already thinking of future projects beyond that. So maybe you can give us, uh, give the audience a little bit of an insight into you know, what yeah, would you do uh, next? Yeah, at the moment we are thinking, the, 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 the particle physics community is thinking about um, two, two types of, um, broadly, two types of machine. One is a circular collider, like the one of the LHC, but bigger. Because if you want to achieve higher energy, you need uh, a bigger circumference and you need a more powerful technology, more powerful magnets. So we, we are developing now the, 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 the future generation magnets that are based on a different material, the same material that you use at, um, at ITER. It's called niobium tritin, and allow, it allows us to, to increase the magnetic field by a factor of two compared to what we have today in the LHC. So one possibility is to go to a um, circular machine like the LHC uh, with more powerful magnet. Another possibility is to have a linear collider where one would collide uh, electrons and positrons rather than, uh, than, than, than protons to study the Higgs boson with um, highest, the largest precision. Uh, at the moment, um, we are um, doing a feasibility study in Europe for a, a circular, future circular collider called FCC, so similar to the LHC but uh, bigger, which can also collide electron and positron, and so allow to study the exposure in all details. So we are at the level of feasibility study, of course. And as I mentioned for the um, LHC, at the beginning, it looks like mission impossible. But then, little by little. But that's 20-year, 30-year project, I guess, right? So it's, it's setting the scene now for generations of young physicists Absolutely. who are probably still at school. I mean, not even at school. They will be the ones reaping the rewards of the work that's being done today. Absolutely, and uh, the skills that uh, this kind of projects uh, um, provide to the young uh, to the young people are wide ranging, and they go from engineering to uh, data analysis, artificial intelligence to uh, you know computing, uh, um, detector sensor, you know, and um, and actually you have to think that uh, the, the young generation that we that we train. Um, they do not all stay in, um, in research, of course, in, at least in our field, only 10% of the young people, the young students and postdocs that uh, do their, their um, thesis and then the, their first year of postdoctoral research in particle physics, only 10% of them remain in research in our field. The others go somewhere else and, 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 and most of them go to the private sector. And uh, and they are um, and they have uh, from what I know they have no difficulties in finding jobs at the level of their talent and expectations and uh, surveys of uh, the young people who left the field when we ask them what what did you learn at CERN that is today most useful for your current work they say working in international team uh, and uh, uh, you know understanding how to solve challenge, uh, out of this challenges, uh, problem solving, um, going through big, dif big, big difficulties, etc., and try to find solutions. Mm. And so, Tony, on your side, you know, 
walk us through the roadmap as it exists today the fusion roadmap you know when when i mean it, it probably i don't know is it going to be in my lifetime is it going to be in my kids lifetime when are we going to when am i going to charge my phone from a fusion reactor well uh, well the good thing about science is also that people get older and older so <laughs> there, there, there's more and more hope um uh, no i i well at, at the moment our our idea is that uh, demo so the demonstration reactor after after ITER will uh, come in operation in the early 50s uh, i i will then be approaching the 100 years uh, so you know uh, who knows uh, but certainly i, I think the, the great moments until that time was well i, I already alluded to, to the uh, uh, deuterium tritium operation of jet later this year um, in a few months from now, in April, um, uh, JET will not be longer the largest uh, operating tokamak in the world, uh, because together with Japan, we have built a new machine uh, about 100 kilometers north of Tokyo, which we take in operation on the 17th of April. And that will be another device which, which will help ITER uh, quite a lot also in, in resolving some issues because these machines are a little smaller and more flexible. You can try out things much, much more easily. So ITER will come in operation in 2025 on the 23rd of December, uh, <laughs> 10 past three. Uh, so you, <laughs> we have Note that down. Everybody, everybody listening, note that down. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's... Um, uh, but then it uh, will take, so uh, usually these machines are so complex, you start operating them uh, even uh, when, they're, when they're not, uh, let's say, completely uh, put together. It's, it's like building a car and uh, as soon as you have the engine, you have the wheels and the steer, you start uh, already uh, to test whether it's driving and later you put the passenger seat and, and whatever. <laughs> so that's how we build ITER and ITER will come in full performance only in 2035. So then we really create these conditions where, where you have break even. That will be also from the physics point of view, very exciting because it's for the first time that the helium particles which we create by fusion have so much energy that they can self-heat the plasma. Uh, so this is very exciting because it means we, we need to control the, the hot plasma in a completely different way. And uh, so we, we know, we think we know how to do that. And, and we, we use very advanced uh, control techniques. And of course we are working a lot with, well, uh, Fabiola already mentioned artificial intelligence. And, you know, there's so many novel techniques which we're all putting together to, to make uh, on the, our, our endeavor a success. Um, and, and also the sequencing. So, at the moment, we uh, just um, uh, finished the uh, pre-conceptual design of demo. The conceptual design will be finished at the end of this decade, by the time ITER is finished. And that's a time when the industry, which, which has built ITER, where the people will come available. And we want to also involve them in the, in the already early design of demo to make sure that what we design in our laboratories can be made by industry to avoid that we are going with a concept to industry, industry said, what's that? We cannot make that. And so this is also something we, which we learned over the years to do it in that way, rather than to first make a design, go to industry, and then hear, well, sorry, but we need to redesign and, and it cannot be done in that way. And well, it's, it's very exciting. And so indeed we made this roadmap, which runs all the way until a demo in 20, 2050s. And we basically, for each gap in our knowledge, we have a kind of plan how we are going to explore. And our roadmap, I always compare with a with a navigation system. If you if you drive, if I want to drive from here to the Netherlands where you live, then I put it in my navigation system. And my navigation system is clever. If there's a traffic jam or there's an accident or whatever. It gives me a, a an alternative route and it tries to keep the time I reach you in the Netherlands uh, roughly at the same time. Our roadmap is kind of similar. The only problem is the roads we are going over, they have not been designed yet. So um, it's, it's kind of more complex. It's like we the, have Chi the Chinese railroad approach where you're sort of building it as you're going across the land, right? You just put it a few yeah, just in front of the train. A bit of comparison. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> So to, to answer the question, I mean, and I don't, I don't mean this in any detrimental way at all, but, you know, 
the time when fusion reactors, let's say, have replaced, I mean, and, and again, everybody, you know, if, if they don't know nuclear fusion reactors, just because it says nuclear, it's not the same technology as nuclear fission reactors, very different in terms of long-term um, dangers and radioactivity and so on, um, much safer machines. Um, but they're not, you're not going to have on the site of every nuclear fission reactor that exists today, there's not going to be a nuclear fusion reactor until 2060s, 2070s, let's say, on, broadly speaking, right? It, it will, will take, it takes some time. Of course, once you, you have a working design, you can copy the design. You don't need every, every machine to go through such a lengthy phase of design, so you can do it more quicker, and then you can yeah. roll out the, the uh, let's say, the fusion technology, and that goes definitely more right. quick. Because I think the thing that people don't understand very often, I mean, you know, there's this classical image from the Second World War, uh, where the first nuclear fission reactor was made in a in a basketball court, right? You just chuck enough uranium or plutonium in one place, it'll work. Um, it, you know, you just have to be careful about how well it works or that it doesn't work too well. Where it was, whereas fusion, the technology involved in getting these these ions up to these enormous temperatures and holding them, that they don't just splash over the walls. I mean, it's it's again, it's that business, you know, oh, nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, what's the difference? It's all nuclear, it must be the same. I mean, they're just vastly different in the technological challenges. It's a, it's a huge difference. Of course, you, we have the hydrogen bomb. So the hydrogen bomb already shows that you can have fusion on Earth, but, but you, you don't want to make fusion that way. You want to really do it in a safe way. And, yeah. and well, that, that really has a, 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 a well, we, we need a long time. And, right. and uh, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, a, a, a fusion reactor has no potential for runaway in that same sense at all. You've got something like, if I remember rightly, for ETA, at any given time, there's two grams of deuterium and tritium at these very high temperatures. If, if, if an accident, whatever that means, happens, basically nothing happens, right? It just, the machine switches off. The machine switches off and, and also it's an under pressure. So uh, there will be cold air sucked into the machine and basically the, the reaction extinguishes. Uh, and so it's very little uh, radioactive material. And also, well, of course, the, the wall of the reactor will become radioactive. Uh, but since we can use the materials uh, and we can use materials with a low radio toxicity, uh, you, you can reuse the materials roughly after 100 years. So you don't need to store them for 10,000 of year in salt mines or on the sea or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, an hour has flown by um, and uh, uh, I've got to say, I mean, there's so many questions and so many, you know, insights and so on. And I wonder, again, almost to kind of go back to the beginning, I mean, we were talking about timescales and cooperation, all that. Beyond the innovation, beyond the discoveries that the work that you both do represent, is there something else that you think perhaps the wider world can learn from the way that you do the work that you do? I mean, the way that you cooperate and also the way that you kind of accept that this is incremental at times the pace is glacial, you know, um, that it is not going to happen necessarily the next six months, the next six years. Is that a lesson that, that you think the wider world can maybe take something away from the work that you do? Yes. Go oh. on. Yeah, I, I, I would say, well, I, I always see it as, as kind of peace projects. And, and I still remember, um, it's, it's now three years ago that Ukraine joined Eurofusion. So they basically joined us and it was in a meeting at ITER where I had to tell the news. And then at the end of my speech, a Russian guy stood up and I thought he's now going to be very nasty because the Ukraine came in. And then he said, well, Tony, I'm very happy and I want to congratulate you with the fact that Ukraine is now joining via Europe because we cannot officially collaborate anymore between Russia and Ukraine because the animosity be, be, be between our countries. But many of our friends and colleagues, which we always used to work with for many, many years, they are in Ukraine and we cannot see them, we cannot talk to them. And now we can work again uh, with them via, via Europe. And so he was very happy and delighted. And this really shows that we are, we are really trying to build bridges. And uh, politicians sometimes, they, they need to better look at our model because it, it really helps in many cases to, to work together. And uh, also now you can see, well, in, in COVID, we see in Europe that many of the scientific organizations are 
putting their heads together and helping each other and, and trying to develop methods to, to, uh, to develop COVID. Still, you can see that on a world level, many of the countries are trying to invent the wheel themselves rather than collaborating. And, and we can do much more together if we just put all our forces together and, and, and really see the added value. Mm. Well said. Yes. And, and I think related to that, what we alluded to before, um, the fact, the sharing of information, transparency, uh, what, we, what we learn is available to everybody. Uh, um, we, um, this, this concept of open access is very, very important, not only to, uh, to, to push the development of science, because the more we share the data, the more we share the knowledge, of course, the, uh, the better science we develop and the faster uh, uh, science will develop but also to, um, to reduce inequalities uh, across the world, because we live in a society which is really characterized by big gaps between uh, developed countries and developing countries, the rich and the poor. And every time we have a crisis like the one we have today, these gaps widens. And so uh, clearly education and information accessible to, to, to everyone, knowledge accessible to, to everybody is a very powerful way to uh, reduce these inequities because the best thing that you can do to empower people is to give them knowledge. And, uh, and I think that this is uh, also something special in our, in our research institution. Well said. Let me pick up on it because I completely agree, of course. But there's another issue as well about how you place what you do in the context of the wider culture. So, you know, Space Rocks brings together musicians and artists and fiction writers and filmmakers and actors. Because, you know, let's be honest, in the world we live in, you know, people maybe don't have much, lots of people don't have much time for fundamental physics. You know, they're, they're either have got busy lives and they're struggling to survive uh, in other ways or they're entertaining or they're, you know, they're interested in sport. So how do you see the role of your organizations in that regard, you know, reaching out sort of the, into a broader culture, not, not, not only in terms of sharing scientific information. I know CERN has done a lot of this. Eurofusion is a more diverse organization. Um, just, you know, before we finish this evening, just give us a feel how you reach out and kind of, in a way, how you put yourself in people's living rooms rather than them having to come to your accelerator or to your fusion reactor. Right? That's a metaphor. For, you know, how, how, do we, how do we talk to people on their terms rather than our terms to engage them? Well, I know, Fabio, that you've done a lot of this work. And of course, as a musician yourself, this is something which is interesting yeah, okay. to you. Anyway. So uh, clearly, for, for what you mentioned about you know, culture in general, um, I am myself a big supporter of, um, of a holistic approach to, um, to culture and I don't like these silos where you have, you know, science, humanities, the arts, and they are completely different things. And uh, because also, perhaps maybe also for my own education, but for instance, at CERN, we have a very successful program, which is called Arts at CERN, uh, where um, artists uh, come and spend some time at CERN. Well, now we are in COVID times, but you know, before COVID and I hope after COVID, uh, we have um, resident artists that come and, uh, and develop their ideas and they're inspired by science and we are inspired by them. And we try to build bridges and we, are, we try to, to show also to the public that, uh, that the arts and science are, are two manifestations of, uh, of the same underlying uh, curiosity, creativity, uh, ingenuity of the, of the human being. So, um, so this, I think it's, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think people, um, the public and, and uh, resonate a lot on um, this. And of course, it's always important to continue to, you know, um, that we scientists really speak the language of, um, of, uh, of the layman or the layperson because, of course, we, uh, we cannot pretend that everybody is an expert. So trying really to reach out people with simple language. I, I used to say that physics is simple. I, I believe that the physics is simple. Um, and if you, low at the low, uh, if you look at the laws uh, of nature on the most fundamental level, the level of particle physics or the, the level of uh, general relativity, at the end, the fundamental equations are really simple and beautiful, by the way. So again, arts and, uh, and size and beauty and, and, and size. Um, so I think that we have to make an effort also to 
continue to um, not only to uh, share what we do with the public, but also in simple terms, in way in ways that um, where we can also share with them uh, the um, how to say the passion, our passion for what we do um, in, uh, in, in 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 a way that is accessible to everybody. Mm. <clears throat> and on the fusion side, Tony, I, I you know I hate to say it, but again, I think I, I sort of alluded to earlier. Um, the word nuclear is there, and of course, for, for for many people in society at a very low level, that that invokes the wrong thing. I mean, a, f- a few years ago, I was asked to give a talk about what we did in ESA for outreach, talking about missions to explore the cosmic microwave background or uh, go to Mars. I was asked by the nuclear fission industry to give them a talk, and I just didn't envy them their job at all. That they were public relations people in the nuclear fission industry trying to persuade the public you know that their industry because their industry is important but people have a natural fear of it so in your in your business in the fusion world you know h- how do you engage the public not only in terms of what Fab- uh, fabiola said you know culturally but also overcoming a fear because of course cern had this wonderful fear that it was going to create a mini black hole and, and destroy the earth you know that became that sort of crazy trope for a while and fusion again it's nuclear so it's bad isn't it well in, well, in that sense, the, the best is to be open and transparent. And you, you shouldn't uh, try to hold anything back. Uh, so I, I learned uh, during my, my, my career that it's better to just be open. Than, because public always, they, they feel if you try to hold something back, if you're not telling something. Yeah. So it's better to be open and, 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 and also talk to everyone. So uh, to, to school kids, to students, uh, to people on the street, uh, go out. So we have been uh, giving lectures on on pop concerts. Uh, um, so in the Netherlands, you have these very nice events where basically they mix kind of science with with uh, with pop. Uh, uh, I think that works quite well. We also regularly uh, have artists over the floor, which which basically are inspired. They hear about fusion. We have. Um, I think it's now three years ago a Spanish pop group which recorded, there were a few weeks at Jet to record the sounds of all the equipment, vacuum pumps, fold should open and close. And from that, they made a composition. And uh, well, it's, it's uh, actually very special. We talked to uh, artists which make sculptures or well, actually I have here at home um, a piece uh, on the wall because uh, my, my wife, uh, my ex-wife in the past had a gallery and so I, I spoke often with the artist about fusion and some got inspired and they then also try to, to make, do something with fusion. So you can see that if you talk to people, the idea and the spark comes over and, and people start to do something with it. And whether it's school kids, which get this into our heads and think, well, that's great. Also, I think the picture behind you is, uh, isn't it from the Iron Man movie or <laughs> one of the... So this, I, 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 yeah, it's, it's, an art, it's an artist. It's not, you know, I think it's just somebody who was inspired by Fusion who made it. The name's in the bottom corner there, over there somewhere. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the, the Iron Man uh, movie, when they, when they made the movie, they didn't shot a, shoot a movie at Jad, but the, uh, the conductor came to Jad to look at Jad and how it looks like, and then they went back to Hollywood and made a movie. So you can see that uh, it, it's really inspiring at all levels in, in society. And, and just be open and, and, and talk about it, publish about it. And well, also this kind of, of program. So I'm very happy that you invited us uh, because also this contributes that people worldwide uh, hear about fusion. Maybe some of the people tonight, they hear it for, for the first time. Some people, maybe they know and they want to know more, but I, I think it's good to, to keep talking about the subject. Yeah, I mean, and just for, you know, we, we, of course, we put some. There are some links on the web page, and we'll we'll put links there. So, anybody wants to find out more, just let us know on Space Rocks. And of course, you know, CERN and, and Eurofusion have websites, lots of information which which exists already. But yeah, just at the World Wide Web is there. I mean, just type in, you know, type in in the search, and you'll find all the information you need. But uh, yeah, and I agree with you completely. I mean, this it's this openness and transparency at the science level the open access to data that that we make our information available uh, freely. I mean, and around the world as well, even if you're not a member of this organization that's even paying for it, the information is available. Um, But again, talking to people and it's, you know, again, Fabiola, I I will say, you know, 
the, the equations of general relativity. I'm going to I'm going to invite you to give a talk to some people at some point and say now make it simple. I know it is in some way, but once you've got the right training. Um, but again, it's that thing of you know engaging at all of the levels and using other people's curiosity because people are curious. That's been our experience, definitely. You know, people are interested in coming to listen and work with us because they know that in some broad sense, what we do is what they do. It's about curiosity. It's just been slightly directed in a different way. Um, and finding that common ground has been one of the most exciting things in my life in the last few years. Um, outside of my normal silo, seeing that that same spirit of curiosity exists everywhere. Indeed. At the same time, we have a world which is becoming anti-scientific and anti-fact. So, you know, you said at the beginning, Tony, right, you know, we've, maybe you've m earlier this week crossed one partial bridge there, perhaps, of getting rid of that. But it's a thing we all have to fight against as well, the sort of rejection of science. So that's a topic for another day. We've, we've uh, spent an hour and 20 minutes already, but we'll invite you back on to discuss that. How do we, how do we get rid of anti-science? Indeed. Indeed. Well, I, I suppose, uh, Mark, in our own way, um, you could say space rocks is its own kind of collider. You know, and, uh, I think conversations like tonight are uh, a really great example of why it's important um, to uh, to borrow a word that uh, Fabiola used earlier. It's a it's a it's a it's a duty to try and create these connections. I think so. Um, Mark, I'm going to leave it to you to decide whether we uh, enact our tradition. Oh, we have to. We have to. I'm, I'm good enough friends with Fabiola and Tony. So okay. we have a we have a, a, a signing. It's nothing. It's nothing embarrassing. Well, it might be the only person to give you a prelude. The only out of all of the episodes of Uplink we've done, the only person we didn't ask to do this was Tony Daniels, who is the actor who plays C-3PO in the Star Wars movies. And that's because it would be too much to cross the franchises. So we sign off with a, a, a hand signal. This is if, if you know your Star Trek, this is the vulcan salute which is live long and prosper uh and then the rocks the the horns of rock so if you can do those two things <laughs> perfect so space space and rocks that's the thank you okay <laughs> so fabiola works out which finger <laughs> thank you very much both of you for coming on it's it's, look, it's been a pleasure working with you over the years and thank you very much for coming into uh, uh into space rocks and i i from a personal perspective, I look forward to seeing you both again uh, in the near future when when the current unpleasantness is behind us. But uh, but we will be talking in other meetings in the meantime. But thank you very much for coming this thank evening. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Fantastic. Well, Mark, uh, that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what lovely people as well. I mean, gosh, just uh, Absolutely. Inspira inspirational chats, not just... Uh, mind-bending but also just to, you come away just feeling kind of inspired as well you know because we, we can be quite remarkable as a species when we want to be yeah and i realize you know it's 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 the perspective thing for me i mean those of us who are lucky enough and priv privileged enough and, and indeed you know this is publicly funded work that we're doing so it's the taxpayers allowing us sort of to indulge ourselves in in you know our curiosities um but Sometimes it becomes just the job. It becomes the thing that you do, and and the perspective that people in other scientific fields um, bring, and the people in in the arts and the cultural field bring their perspective as well. I think that for me is what Space Rocks is all about. It's about bringing people in who, you know, in a way, you turn a mirror and say, you know, what is it that I do, you know, and, and how does this sit in the bigger the bigger culture? Um, and both Tony and and Fabiola. The, they know this well, and I, it was just a great pleasure to be able to probe their minds on on how they see that fitting in the world. Fully totally agree, as ever, Mark. A pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we can't foreshadow next week's uh, uplink, but we will most assuredly be back on Thursday, around the same time. So keep an eye on our socials. Sign up to our newsletter. The link is in the YouTube chat. And as ever, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Thanks very much. Bye, bye, everybody. We'll see you next week.